This is a video recording on YouTube for Weimar College, English 102. This is uh, about, I think, number eight in a series of lectures on the book of Job. We will uh, begin with chapter 19 of Job. Uh, my students who are watching this video already, we, you know we've already covered uh, chapter 19 pretty thoroughly, but I just want to overlap with that and recap. Uh, chapter 19 is an incredibly important chapter in the book because it's roughly halfway through. Chapter 19 is Job's fullest expression of the true nature of the most profound uh, kind of human suffering, namely uh, the experience of complete and total rejection by other human beings because of the perception that Job is rejected by God, hated by God, punished by God for some as of yet unknown great wickedness. Of course, Job refuses to confess sins he is not aware of or can't recall, rightly so. To that extent, he maintains his integrity. He also maintains his integrity because he refuses to curse God or to accuse God of uh, wickedness. Um, now, the issue of divine justice is always, you know, lurking in the background as we read through the entire book of Job. Uh, it just suffices to say at this stage that Job has a point from the human perspective, um, and and to some extent, even from the divine divine perspective, Job has been exposed to Satan. The hedge has been removed that presumably protected him full time from Satan's predatory uh, will. That hedge has been removed, so now Job is vulnerable, and of course Satan takes advantage of that vulnerability and causes all this harm to Job's family. He kills all ten children, destroys his estate, takes away all of Job's wealth, which of course is perceived as a blessing from God, a gift from God. It is indeed God's wealth, uh, and Satan destroys it, or eliminates it from Job's experience. So all of this suggests that Job has been rejected by God, and yet Job can see no reason for this severe form of punishment. And he asks God to explain. But he never accuses God of unrighteousness. But he does lament his condition to the point that he wishes he had never been born, uh, even to the extent of wanting the day of his birth, his birthday, to be an uncreated day. Uh, he thinks that it would have been better had he been stillborn and carried from womb to grave. Anything is better than the suffering which he now endures, which has obviously pushed Job to the very limit of human endurance. However, it is important to also note, based on the evidence in the narrative, in the dialogue, that at no point does Job curse God. He wants to die, and because that would relieve his suffering, but he does not want to turn on God. He does not want to accuse God of, of wickedness. But at the same time, he cannot claim wickedness for himself. Now, of course, there would be some relief in, in being able to identify the sin that caused his suffering, but Job can't find that sin. So the, the real epicenter of suffering here is partly a matter of not understanding. And human beings really, really feel keenly the pain of confusion or uh, contradiction. We can take a lot if we can see purpose in it. By that I mean we can take a lot of pain persecution, injustice, if we can see that something better will come about because of the injustice done to us. And I think we see that in Job, that although even God admits to Satan that he has moved against Job without cause, because Satan has in a sense put God in a, a position where he has to respond by testing Job in order to show who Satan really is, and also demonstrate that human beings can love God even if God does not, quotes, bless them. All of that's at stake. Um, but it's important to understand that um, 
that Job, he, he's not so much complaining of his suffering, although it's intense. He's more concerned with the fact that he doesn't see a purpose in it and he can't see the, the reason for it. To me, that, that really comes out through all of Job's speeches. But of course, there's also the physical pain, which Job does allude to. But more than that, especially in chapter 19, Job laments the fact that all of his human associates, from the lowest to the highest, from his servants to his wife to his friends, to even the children of men who were much who were his social uh, inferiors, the whole mass of society at all levels has turned on him. So he is completely isolated from all human uh, support. And that, of course, is an extension from Job's e perhaps, I think, even more painful sense that God, like all these people around him, has just rejected him, turned his back on Job. So if you look at 19, uh, you'll notice, for example, that Job, not in, in verses 7 through 12, he says, basically, God counts me as one of his enemies. I'm now God's opponent. God has turned on me. And then in 13 and onwards, Job laments the fact that God has removed his brothers far from me. Whatever God is doing, the net result has been that God has caused all of Job's family to reject him. Completely. Even his servants, this is verse 15 of chapter 19, they, they refuse to respond to his calls. He says that he begs them. He begs his own servants. I call my servant, verse 16, but he gives no answer. I beg him with my mouth. My breath is repulsive to my wife. And then go down to verse 21. Here's Job's call to, to all humanity. Have pity on me, have pity on me, O oh you, my friends. And of course, that is not possible. There is no pity shown to Job. At this point, he does not feel compassion from his creator, his God. And he certainly does not experience any love from uh, his human family or associates or friends or even his servants. And of course, the, the, uh, the ethical mandate here, this is Job's sort of, uh, from the place of suffering, this is Job's attempt to awaken human beings to a fundamental responsibility, namely to take pity on suffering people before you before you do anything else, give them a drink of water. Give them a kind word. Uh, there's almost a sense here in which um, pity uh, trumps even moral considerations. To be sure, most human suffering is caused by our own sins. But I don't see anywhere in Scripture where that fact would give us permission to treat people harshly who are suffering on the grounds that they've caused their own suffering. I mean, God doesn't do that. So Job recognizes that regardless of the cause for one's suffering, whether it's one's own wickedness or whether it's a sign of one's righteousness, human suffering demands human pity. That's a baseline principle throughout this book, but, but Job can't find it. None of his friends will extend that to him. Uh, moving on, We should also, uh, I mean, there's more here, of course. Bildad has a very short speech in chapter 25, all of six verses. And Bildad says, as part of this, uh, this foray, or this really, it's an attack on Job. Verse 4, how then can man be righteous before God? Now, that's a very troubling rhetorical question. Because, to be sure, man in his own strength cannot be righteous before God. But in the context of the plan of redemption... There is a way for man to be righteous before God. There is grace and, of course, forgiveness, but also grace and power from God that enables men to be righteous. 
And Job is, is, is an example of that. And according to Job, he is still a prime example of that. He is still righteous before God. Uh, that's Job's testimony. But of course, Bildad can't accept that because Job is, is being treated badly by something or someone who Bildad assumes is God. We know that it's Satan. Um, but to be sure, God has allowed Satan to attack Job at a vulnerable time. God removed his, his protection from Job, you know, and so forth. But yet this question that Bildad poses in verse 4, 25, 4, chapter 25, verse 4, is really important to focus on. When, when Bildad asks this question, how then can man be righteous before God, the implication that this question puts out there is that no, man cannot be righteous before God. It's true within certain parameters, namely none of us can be righteous before God in our own strength. But it's utterly false in the sense that, according to God's grace and plan of redemption, man can be righteous before God. Not in his own strength, not according to his own nature, but through the power of the Holy Spirit and grace. For how can he be pure who is born of a woman? This is a big question. How can man recover his innocence? How can man be virtuous given that he's born in sin? Um... And then Job goes further. In verse 5 he says, If even the moon does not shine and the stars are not pure in his sight. Well, this is strange language, isn't it? Even the stars are not pure in God's sight. In other words, the implication here is that God is so righteous and so great that God finds fault with even his own creation. Now this is very disturbing to me because, again, there is this Sort of, there's this thought here that God made this imperfect creation. Now, this is Satan's idea. God made an imperfect creation. He made beings who, even before sin, were incapable of obeying or loving or following God. In other words, Satan is not suggesting that man, or indeed Satan and his fallen angels, made a wrong choice. In perfect freedom, they decided to go wrong, to become bent. He's saying, he's suggesting, and this is coming through Bildad, that man was flawed even at the beginning of his creation. God made a mistake in creating man. Man is incapable of loving and worshiping God. Therefore, Satan is right and God is wrong regarding the creation of this world. And it could go even further. I mean, this is somewhat speculative, but you, you can kind of fill in the narrative gaps here. You can hear Satan saying, you know, I wasn't included. I wasn't a part of the creation plan. Therefore, it can't be a good plan because I wasn't there. <laughs> and therefore, when Bildad says, God doesn't even, he doesn't even consider the stars to be pure in his own sight. That's tantamount to saying that God made a universe, and now God regards it as a mistake. It's flawed. And then, of course, there's verse 6, where Bildad rhetorically again, it's a question, it's a rhetorical question, but rhetorical questions are, of course, really statements. They're a little bit deceptive that way. How much less man who is a maggot and a son of man who is a worm? Now, there's a sense in which this is true. Uh, John Bunyan, rather famously in his spiritual autobiography, refers to himself as a worm, but what he's describing is his sinful condition. Which, of course, Bunyan also understood um, was not the final statement on who he would be. Uh, his destiny is not to remain a maggot or a worm. But here's what's interesting. Although in our sins we are probably less than maggots, um, worthy only of destruction. God, in his grace and his mercy and compassion, and in his great love for fallen mankind, regards us as something more. By the merits of Jesus, through the power of the cross, through the Holy Spirit, we are raised up. But even before, even while we're in our sins, even while we are arguably moral maggots, God loved us while we were yet sinners. Not because we deserved it, but because God loves the people that he 
he's made, as broken as they are. So Bildad, look at chapter 25. It's only six verses. Look carefully at it, and you can hear the satanic influence, the idea that man is fundamentally worthless, a maggot. Now, of course, that's an easy assumption to buy into because if you examine human nature, you see these flaws, this depravity. And yet there's more to man than depravity because God has chosen to empty all of heaven for these maggots, that they might become the sons of God. So this is a partial truth, and to that extent, it propagates an error. Okay, we need to move on then to Elihu. I think one of the essay topics asked the question, who is Elihu? Now, there's some background to this. Elihu is not a, a member of the original group of men, the group of three who come to comfort Job. He kind of emerges out of nowhere. Uh, suddenly, we discover him in chapter 32 of Job. So I'll read that now, 32.1. So these three men ceased answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. They give up. They're convinced he's wicked. He's not. Therefore, all dialogue ceases. But then this Elihu character intervenes. This is verse 2. Then the wrath of Elihu. Notice the word wrath. This has not been a term that we, uh, we find applied to the other uh, three uh, comforters or friends of Job or companions of Job. Um, his wrath, then the wrath of Elihu was aroused because Job justified himself rather than God. This is chapter 32, verse 2. He justified himself rather than God. And that, of course, sounds um, very orthodox. We should not justify ourselves, rather we should justify God always. The problem is simply this. Job can't justify God because he doesn't understand how what's happened to him is just. He simply can't see it. It will be dishonest for Job to justify God when he feels injustice, um, when he can't understand what God is doing or how it is just. However, Job does understand according to his own lights, his own conscience, that he has not done anything to deserve this level of divine punishment. So in a sense, Elihu is angry about the fact that Job is an honest broker. Job refuses to pretend that he's wicked in order to justify God. Uh, so like the other uh, three friends, Elihu refuses to acknowledge Job's integrity the possibility that Job is telling the truth. Instead, the assumption is that in any situation where man and God are in relationship, in any situation that occurs, even if you have to lie to yourself about what's really happening inside of you or around you, even if you have to make up a completely fictional account, you have to justify God. That's an interesting problem. What happens to people who always justify God, even though they feel they're being treated unjustly? What kind of Christians would they be if all of their piety and their conservatism or their, their devotion is based upon a lie or some level of dishonesty about how they really feel about God? I think that corrupts religion. At any rate, um, he's wrathful as well, verse 3, because his three friends, that's Job's three friends, again, wrath is aroused in verse 3, so this means a lot he was really angry, because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. So they're also, he's also angry at the three friends because they keep condemning Job, but they haven't solved Job's problem. So Elihu now is promising, well, this is, this is the promise that his speeches carry, that he's going to do essentially what the three friends have done, but he's going to do it better, because he's going to actually explain to Job why it is that Job is suffering. Oh, 
power problem here. We'll stop.